The first quicksort partitioning algorithm I described relies on the selection of a pivot value, which is used to partition an unordered list into three sublists. The leftmost item in the list is chosen to be the pivot. Then, items at left and right pointers are compared with it and data is moved accordingly. The partitioning process can then be repeated with the two unordered sublists on either side of the pivot, which will generate even more sublists. We continue to repeat the process with any sublists we generate that contain more than one item. And ultimately, we'll have only single items, which are all in the right place. The second quicksort partitioning algorithm I described didn't rely on the explicit selection of a pivot value. Rather, it compared pairs of values at left and right pointers and swapped them if necessary to ensure that the smaller of the two values was placed at the left and the larger of the two was placed at the right. With this method, the value that began at the right-hand side of the list is the one that finds itself in the correct position and is therefore, strictly speaking, the pivot. Once you know how to partition a list, writing a quicksort program is a matter of repeating the process for each partition that contains more than one item. So here's some pseudocode for a quicksort program. Before dissecting it, let's visualize the order of operations. The program focuses on the left side first. If it generates a sublist of more than one item on the left, it will partition this next. When there's nothing left to partition on the left side, the program will turn its attention to the most recent right-side sublist that it created. Let's examine the execution of this program with a small list. Remember, this is a zero-based array. The quicksort procedure is passed three parameters when it's first invoked by another program. These are the array that needs to be sorted, along with the lower and the upper bounds of that array. The lower and upper bounds are taken to be the starting positions of the left and right pointers. These pointers are stored on this invocation's stack frame, as shown here. The data array would be passed by reference, so it can be accessed by the caller once it's been sorted. The left pointer is smaller than the right, so the program continues. Firstly, the original list needs to be partitioned into three sublists. This is done by a function with the name partition. The partition function is past the array and the left and right pointers when it's called. Of course, the partition function will have a stack frame at the top of the call stack while it's active, but this isn't shown here. We're going to focus on successive invocations of the quicksort procedure only. The partition function not only partitions the list, but also returns the resting position of the pivot value, which is now in the correct place. The resting position of the pivot can be used to determine the upper bound of the sublist on the left-hand side and the lower bound of the sublist on the right-hand side. Immediately after the original sublist has been partitioned, quicksort calls itself for the first time. The second invocation is past pivot position minus 1 as the third parameter, so this will be taken to be the value of the right pointer by the next invocation. This means that the second invocation is now working on the left-hand side sublist. The first invocation is now suspended below it on the stack. Left is smaller than right, so the second invocation also calls the partition function, which returns a value of pivot position that defines yet another set of sublists. In this case, only two sublists have been generated, including a sublist of one item, that is, the pivot value, and a sublist containing two items on the left of it. This time, the pivot value has found itself in a position where there's no sublist to the right of it. The sublist on the left of the pivot is passed to a third invocation of quicksort, which is seeing an even smaller part of the original list. The pointers are compared, and another sublist is partitioned, and another pivot is returned. This time, it so happens that there's no sublist to the left of the pivot. Nevertheless, pivot position minus one is passed into a new invocation of quicksort. But this invocation has no data to work with. 
the pointers are compared and the negative value of the right pointer is found to be smaller than the value of the left. So this invocation is rather short-lived and is removed from the top of the stack. But there's still work to be done. The previous invocation of quicksort finds itself at the top of the stack once again and it can pick up from where it left off. There's a sublist to the right of the pivot position that this invocation was working with, which, as far as it's concerned, may need to be partitioned further. So this invocation of quicksort calls itself again, but this time pivot position plus one is passed in as the left pointer. With a sublist of only one item to process, the left pointer is not smaller than the right. So this invocation swiftly comes to an end. The third invocation is back in control again. It has dealt with any sublists on either side of the pivot and it can now finish without further interruption. The second invocation is back in control, resuming from where it left off. It still needs to process the sublist to the right of its pivot position, or at least check to see if there is one. Quicksort is invoked again, and the value 3 is passed in as the left pointer. Because the value of the left pointer exceeds that of the right, there's no sublist to work with. So another instance of quicksort ends. Handing control back to its caller. But the second invocation has also finished its work, so it too can come off the stack. Eventually, the very first instance of quicksort has regained control of the processor. The first instance of quicksort can now go to work on the right-hand side of the original list. It calls itself again, passing in a left pointer that defines the start of this sublist. A brand new second invocation begins and is pushed onto the stack. Left is less than right. The partition function is called. New sublists are generated and a new invocation is called upon to process the left side sublist, if there is one. But there's no new sublist here. Left is bigger than right, so this invocation is popped off the stack. The second invocation now has a right side sublist to deal with. Quicksort is called again. It's passed a left pointer value of 5 and a right pointer value of 7. A list of three items means that left is indeed smaller than right, so the partition function does generate some more sublists. Another quicksort is passed pointers to another sublist. These pointer values allow the invocation to continue, and partition is called again. Another call to quicksort is made to deal with another left side sublist but a list of only one item requires no work. When this set of sublists was generated, there was no sublist to the right of the pivot value 8. So another call to process a right side sublist proves to be nothing more than a check. And the invocation that spawned these single item lists can now come to an end. One remaining pivot value needs to be checked for a right side sublist, so quicksort is invoked for the final time. But such a large left pointer value can only mean one thing. This invocation can end without further ado. Now this one can end. And so can this one. leaving the very first invocation back in control with a fully sorted list.